Hello everyone. Um, I'm really excited tonight to uh, welcome an old friend of mine, a uh, very special guest, Nats <laughs> Rellacliff. Hello Nats. Hi. Hello. <laughs> so Nats, as I said in the stream uh, on the comments on the group, is a dog behaviourist and uh, she really, really kindly agreed to uh, come on to the group and give us some of the benefits of her wisdom, hard-earned hard knowledge. Um, she's insured, she's, she's, a, she's got qualifications, and I'm sure we'll come on to all that. Uh, just to point out, we can't, uh, <laughs> hi Jeanette, uh, we, we can't talk about specific cases, but we can talk about the generalities uh, of cases. So like Jeanette, when you're talking about pepper barking, we can talk about the generalities of, 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 of dogs barking because that's mm -hmm. kind of more interesting for everybody in general, isn't it? Is that okay, Nats? Yeah, that's fine, yeah. Fantastic yeah. stuff. Um, so yeah, so I've known Nats now since ooh, the mid 90s. Oh, a while. Something like yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, but tonight we're only going to talk about behaviour, not anything else that went on at university. <laughs> Message me later. <laughs> <laughs> Great stuff. Uh, now, uh, we're doing this through a Facebook call, so if you can post your questions here, we've got a list of ones that uh, people have been sending in uh, over in, in the group. Um, I'm looking after small children tonight, so there's one just poked his head through the door. You alright, buddy? Could you go back to bed? Thanks, man. Thank you. That's all going to be fine, though. I'm pretty sure of it. Um, but if you want me to call you and join in a three-way call on this thing, I'm sure we can do it somehow. But you'll have to probably uh, uh, message me and be a friend. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I, we've got a few questions going here in Nats at the moment. Um, people talking about dogs attacking letterboxes and dogs barking and there's, like I say, a few on the, the group there. Um, you're with the IMDT. I wonder if you mm -hmm. could just tell us a little bit about what a dog behaviorist does, what they can do, what they can't do, the kind of stuff that you cover and what your qualifications are and things like that. Yeah, sure. So, I, um, so I'm a member of, uh, sorry, I trained through the Institute of Modern Dog Trainers um, and I, th I think the most important thing to say about that is, um, as an organisation, they use exclusively what's called positive uh, reinforcement message, uh, methods, which means that we only we work with what the dog wants to do. We aim to understand what it is that the dog is trying to achieve, and we change the behaviour through positive methods. So we don't use any kind of uh, punishments. There's no sort of spray cans or collars involved or things like that that the dog might find uh, frightening or worse uh, painful so all of the methods are force free pain free um, and designed to get inside the dog's mind uh, as far as we can looking at the, the the behavior understanding the neuroscience behind how the dog is thinking and mm -hmm. particularly the emotions um, and observing the dog in their environment and that's actually why uh, John was saying we can only give general advice today because uh, number one rule around uh, dog behavior is to see the dog with you at home um, or interacting out uh, if, if it's a problem outside and outside so that we see the dog in the environmental and social context that, that the dog is uh, living in and if it's a problem behavior uh, that we understand that the circumstances uh, of uh, and the history of that dog so uh, but a behaviourist, unlike a trainer, um, said, will tend to work on uh, usually problems. Um, that's usually what we're contacted for. So those things might be, you know, barking, uh, guarding things. Uh, it might be a dog that tends to bark a lot at other dogs outside, or perhaps at uh, particular things. You know, doesn't like men, or doesn't like uh, bikes that go past, or things like that. Um, whereas a trainer would normally work on your sort of general uh, obedience, um, so you know, good sit training, uh, recalls, and that kind of thing. Um, quite a lot of behaviour work does involve a little bit of training uh, mm. as we as we rehab the dog. Yeah. And uh, you've got a dog yourself as well, haven't you? I do. See, I do. Can, can you see the amazing wonder dog? I'm going to have to go fetch him. One second. He's, he's retired to his bed, being a chihuahua. That's his favourite place. <laughs> he's, he's super great. He's been over in the house, and I know Nats has spent an awful lot of time uh, working with him and uh, getting him, uh, well, addressing his chihuahua issues. <laughs> oh. Yes, so this is Alfie. I hope you can all see him. 
Um, he's a six-year-old hey, uh, Chihuahua <laughs> male, and uh, bless him, he is, as John said, the reason how I got into this. Uh, he's a he's a pedigree pup. Came from a good breeder, um, but unfortunately, we we discovered quite quickly he had a few challenges mm. with life in general, um, and mm-hmm. in particular, they like to take on big dogs. Yeah. Um, so yeah. that's how I got into the whole behaviour side of things, trying like to figure really out how to let this little fella. <laughs> yes, does not know his size. Yeah. Bless him. <laughs> Excellent stuff. So we've got quite a few um, specific questions coming down here. We've been sort of noting down the ones that are have been coming through over uh, the, the, the chat here. And we've got mm-hmm. one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 10, 11, 12. So we've got at least 12 questions and we've got about 50 minutes. So we've got probably about four minutes on, on each one. But I'm going to start okay. off with my first one, which is dogs on sofas. Totes okay or not okay at all? <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Into that one. Um, your house, your rules. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Actually, it's Andrew's <laughs> rules more than mine, to be honest with you. <laughs> If, if you've got lurchers, aren't they just sofas on legs anyway? Yeah, pretty <laughs> so. much, yeah. Yeah, they look really dis- disappointed if they're not allowed up there. But I guess it's all the nature of the dog, isn't it, and what they're like? It's nature dog, and some dogs actually um, sleep more than others, and, uh, mm. yeah, they're going to want to find somewhere cosy. <laughs> so I, why I, not the sofa? Why not? Yeah, I mean, I was sort of, when, when I went through university a um, long time ago, I guess we were still talking about dominance theory in dogs. And, you know, dogs yeah. going on sofas was all about social climbing. But yeah. I understand Four things have moved floor. on since then. They have. And actually, it's a really good um, one to start with because the dominance thing, it's almost like it won't go away. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, it, it's not only problematic because it can lead people to treat their dogs very harshly. Mm-hmm. Um, might be well-meaning. But uh, dogs are fundamentally social. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure if you all think of, of your dogs tonight, you know, they, they, they like to be with you. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're a friend. They like to give, you know, have a cuddle, etc. cetera. Um, and so if we follow uh, the dominance theory, we have to be dominating them. And that tends to mean in human terms that we will mm-hmm. shout at them, that we will push them, that we will deny them things uh, that we think, uh, you know, they, they shouldn't have. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and it, and it breaks down the relationship. Um, dominance in, in reality is, is very specific thing. Uh, it's a bit of a human construct anyway. We, we came up with the idea of dominance to try and help explain, uh, why some dogs appear to do things that uh, might seem quite pushy, you know, take mm. things from us or try and, you know, pull us halfway down the street. Um, when in fact dominance really is um, only ever between two individuals. So it might be between two individual dogs if they are tussling over um, a resource, i.e. a thing they want. Let's say there's a toy on the floor and both of them want it. There might be a, a bit of a, a, a tussle. Uh, and whichever dog manages to get the toy might be deemed the more dominant in that incident. Mm-hmm. And that's it. And obviously, it might change with another dog who wants uh, s- some food. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the dominant dog might lose that interaction and the other dog gets the food. Mm-hmm. So uh, the idea of dominance in training and, and in, in working with your dog is not at all helpful. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not really relevant. It, it only, strictly speaking, refers to a, a single interaction between two individuals in a moment of time over a specific thing. Mm-hmm. That's dominance. Right. So you can see why our general knowledge of dominance, meaning, you know, standing over the dog and, you know, shouting at it, mm-hmm. um, just isn't a concept that dogs understand. And, and when we do uh, behave that way towards dogs it, it confuses them and at worst it can lead to a dog that is very frightened and a mm. frightened dog will bite right so uh, mm. you know it, it, it's a very unhelpful concept and uh is it worth saying as well that you know when, when they do get frightened dogs they often learn things that you don't necessarily want them to learn you know, very uh, absolutely very quickly um of course um you know like humans they have a uh, a stress response that uh, if they fear for uh, for themselves, they will go to a more extreme behavior than they might have done otherwise. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, that extreme behavior might be uh, on one end of the scale, it, it, can, it can go to aggression, it can t- go to biting. Mm-hmm. On the other end, however, you might have a dog that completely freezes, mm-hmm. completely shuts down. Um, and unfortunately, occasionally that can be interpreted as a dog that is um, suddenly behaving really well. Mm-hmm. Say it was barking and, and you, you know, rattled some stones at it and it stopped barking and became very still. Mm-hmm. 
uh, someone might be misled into thinking the dog is now behaving. Uh, unfortunately, what the dog has done is shut down. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's so frightened, uh, it can't cope, doesn't know what to do, doesn't know what's wanted of mm-hmm. it, um, and has stopped doing anything at all. Okay. Um, and so, yes, you can really damage a dog mm-hmm. uh, that, that ends up with that shutdown behavior and, and can trigger anxieties and things like that. Okay, thanks very much. That's really mm. interesting. Um, I want to pick up, first of all, on Bev's question here, which is uh, about lead pulling. Uh, mm-hmm. Now, oh, sorry, that's Annie's question. Excessive pulling Annie. on the lead, no matter how many times I pull him back and say heel. Now, I'm guessing, is that more of a training type issue than a behavior issue? Or is behavior in that? And is there anything that you yeah. could do wrong that would, you know, reinforce negative behavior, uh, re- negative yeah. training? Yeah, there's definitely a behavioural element to to that, um, and I think you say it was Annie who was asking the question. Yeah, that's right. Um, so for Annie and, and owners uh, out there who have uh, dogs that tend to pull, um, from a behavioural point of view, you you need to think about what the dog is is doing. Um, and our understanding of dogs is that they will do things that they find uh, rewarding, so things that they like, things mm-hmm. that they want. Mm-hmm. They'll do more of it. Um, and so in this case, the, the dog is outside, maybe they've been in for a bit, it's you know, not been uh, you know, as exciting as they would like it to be, um, and they're, they're outside, there's a world of smells, there's other dogs, there's other people, there's squirrels and rabbits and all sorts out there, and, and of course the dog is pulling forward because they want to go towards the things that they're finding uh, exciting. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so you, know, you need to understand what the dog is doing uh, and wanting to, to get towards... Um, our human response when the dog pulls is to pull them back mm-hmm. um, and in doing that you, you create a scenario that is uh, is incompatible uh, physically when you pull a dog their instinct is to pull mm-hmm. back so when you feel tension on the lead uh, the dog will pull in response to your tension it's a bit mm-hmm. like us uh, it's almost reflexive you know if you if you were to sort of go like that in your eye, you know, you blink and you and you and you pull back with your head. You know, if you pull with a dog, their instinct is to pull against you and, and try and pull away. Um, so with with loose leash walking, um, it's about working with the dog initially to uh, give the dog something else that's rewarding, and that's why we often work with food. Mm-hmm. Um, food is very good to work with with dogs it's very quick it's easy to administer you can carry it around with you in a dog pouch uh, and almost all dogs will work for some kind of food um, so uh, with loose lead walking you would actually possibly start even in the house if your dog's a really big puller mm-hmm. uh, pop the lead on um, and reward the dog for just having a slack lead so if you're if your dogs you're just standing in your lounge your dog's on a lead Give them a little bit of chicken if they don't go anywhere or they only go as far as the lead sort of still got a nice smile on it mm-hmm. um but that reward stops if they start to pull right. and go tight yeah. and you can progress that then to outside your house to up and down the street it is a slow process mm-hmm. i have to say whenever uh, we do loose leash walking um hands up it's we humans who tend to have the uh, the lack of patience more than the dog mm-hmm. usually the dogs learn pretty quickly hey if i have a nice slack lead you keep feeding me nice stuff like chicken mm-hmm. um if i pull not only do we not go anywhere so this is where we're starting to work with the dog we don't move forward we don't get to go and sniff things mm-hmm. um but also they learn that you know there's no reward coming in in any shape or form mm-hmm. for for pulling on the leash um so and in time once you have uh, taught the dog that a loose lead means good stuff mm-hmm. initially chicken you can then start to work with the dog and say okay you recognize they want to go and sniff that tree mm-hmm. if they walk up to the tree on a loose lead they get to sniff mm-hmm. that's the reward that's the thing they wanted mm-hmm. um, or if they want to go and greet someone if they walk up on a loose lead they get to go and greet the person mm-hmm. uh, if they pull you stop mm-hmm. they have to come back towards you and then you can walk on nice. so that's where behavior and training cross over because we're, we're trying to understand why is the dog pulling mm-hmm. um, and how can we work with the thing the dog wants mm-hmm. to move forward to sniff etc uh, to encourage them actually to, to do that on a loose lead rather than trying to pull and, and of course for owners it's very very difficult you know they, they can get shoulder injuries and wrist mm-hmm. injuries uh, broken fingers we've seen mm-hmm. the works um, yeah. from dogs that suddenly pull yeah i mean i i know um uh, I, I'm a massive favour of using uh, dog psychology and dog behaviour in 
training because without a deeper understanding of what's going on in their heads you you can't just treat them like dumb no. automata you know I, I look at angela working with the horses sort of natural horsemanship and it's very much yes, trying to understand the their motivations and drivers behind things okay yeah. um the, the next question i want to move on to now is one from dave which was up here um jack russell puppies that's getting uh, five months old getting a little bit snappy over things and people uh, and that this is something that we see relatively uh, common uh, commonly amongst uh, especially jack russells and terriers um mm -hmm. is there a particular problem you feel or is there a, is this particular issue with terriers and what sort of things can people do you know because it's it's quite uh, it can be quite overwhelming you know with a young dog that's come in it's yeah you know you bought this you know the dog to be a pleasure and it's turning out to be a little bit of a nightmare and they're being snappy yeah, yeah. i think um so with a puppy um one would first go on the basis that that is is fairly typical puppy behavior that they're beginning to become more independent a bit more mm -hmm. juvenile mm -hmm. uh, around that age um and that uh, they have discovered their teeth Mm -hmm. and that they can be highly effective especially if the first time they use them say they want a toy and you know they, they you go to reach it and they want it and they nip mm -hmm. you pull away they've got the toy so again it's back to that psychology of the dog they wanted the toy they used their mouth to try and tell you to say I want it mm -hmm. uh, and it worked mm -hmm. because uh, you took your fingers away mm -hmm. um, and so there's there's a lot of that kind of behavior that can be um, very effectively uh, managed and in that way stopped in that if you have a pup um, first of all making sure that you don't leave things around that you don't want them to have I know it sounds uh, you know potentially a bit defeatist but for mm -hmm. example if somebody has got a problem with puppies sort of nipping uh, or, or, you know, or, or taking shoes or something like that you know put away the things that you don't want the pup to mm -hmm. get um, the reason being that not only do you then not come home to a choo choo but also you don't start to get into a conflict with your puppy. Mm -hmm. So what we want to avoid is that it becomes a tussle between you and the dog. You know, the thing they want, the thing you want, you end up tussling, wrestling with them. That is encouraging the puppy to explore avenues to, to get that thing from you, including, of course, teeth. Mm -hmm. um, and so number one rule is put things away, put things out of reach that are going to be a problem mm -hmm. for the puppy to get hold of mm -hmm. um, so they're not snappy. The next thing to to do with a pup then is to is to practice sort of polite behavior and, and a really good way to do that is to practice swaps. Mm -hmm. So it's you give the dog one thing, you play with it for a while, you know, rag it around. So you've got a rubber ring or a toy uh, mm -hmm. as a way to teach a swap. Play nice, low, slow sort of to the ground swings. Puppy finds it super exciting and then let the toy sort of go dead. Just go still with the toy. Mm -hmm. The dog will probably pull away for a bit, but just keep your hand still. You know, it's no longer exciting. As mm. soon as they let go, swap the toy out and then start this little nice sort of low, slow game of tuggy with the mm. next toy. Let it go dead, swap it out again. What you're teaching the dog is, you know, if these things are not, if you're not pulling and wrestling at them and they, and they stop, you let go, you get rewarded with something else. Mm. Once the dog's got that idea, you can add in a cue like drop. Mm. So you're teaching the dog to drop. So you can you can begin to sort of train your pup to say, you know, you do get the things you want mm -hmm. often, um, but not if you sort of are impolite, not if you nip, not if you bark, not if you pour at me. So all of these common puppy issues are all about the, the pup thinking that's the way I get stuff. And if you teach them a, a, the other way, you know, the, the uh, through the swaps or, for example, doing a nice fit, before you give them something, food or something like that, or before you throw a ball for them, you're teaching them that these are the things that work. Mm. The things that work are being calm. The things that work, that work mm. are letting go or desisting, and, and uh, you get the things that way. Um, we do also inadvertently sometimes train puppies to be mouthy and bitey. Mm -hmm. um, quite often, a lot of us have kids in the house or I don't know the, the crazy uncle who comes over and winds the dog up and <laughs> plays with the dog really rambunctiously. <laughs> and suddenly the dog's like, way I can, I can, you know, bite hands and grab hands, and they flap all over mm -hmm. the place. And this is super exciting. Um, so also be aware that if, uh, if 
if puppies especially are getting a bit nippy, a bit bitey or jumpy, mm. um, that every member of the household knows mm. uh, that if the dog does that, it doesn't get the thing they want. So say it's jumping up, you know, mm. no attention for jumping up, stand still, get your hands out of the way if there's a larger breed dog, mm. look away, don't say anything because mm. the voice is still interaction, still kind of reward. Um, and as soon as pup has falls on the floor again in this instance, then they get a cuddle or they get the nice greeting. Mm. So it's about you, you can you can do a lot of of training with puppies on the go, mm. just during the day, you know mm. that kind of thing. You know, don't greet until the puppy's sort of sitting nicely, not when they're leaping around. Regularly swap things out for mm. them. Regularly call them. You can start practicing recall at home uh, mm. with a puppy very effectively. Mm. Um, and you're just teaching the dog good behaviors and make sure that the humans around the dog are generally calm, generally don't try and sort of wind the dog up. Mm. Uh, it's not always deliberate, but it's very easy mm. to G up a puppy, especially a Jack Russell. Yeah. Um, and, uh, <laughs> you know, they're very motion sensitive, of course, the job they do. Yeah. yeah. Um, if they were if they were working dogs, they would be chasing down rats. Mm. So be aware as well with, with a breed like that, with a terrier breed and particularly Jack Russell, they're very motion sensitive. So, you know, mm. Walk past them calmly. Don't go storming past them. They are going to chase your feet if they're going to go past, mm. you know, really quick. Um, and be mindful, again, of children. You know, mm. if you need to just put a little puppy pen up or something like that, if there's a very young child around mm -hmm. um, that, you know, perhaps you can't explain the rules to mm -hmm. uh, and find other ways for them to, to interact with the dog okay. and without getting nibbled toes. <laughs> I mean, when, when we talk about biting, I mean, lots of different types of biting. I mean, you yeah. get play biting, sort of exploratory warning biting. Um, how often do you actually find these different types and, and how often do you see sort of the fear biting or even the really aggressive biting? I mean, it, it, in my yeah. experience, that's, that's actually reasonably rare. It's reasonably rare. It, it, it's it's reasonably rare, and, and even more rare is the kind of uh, predatory style biting where where a dog is actually sort of pursuing, uh, you know, in worst case scenario, a, a person. That's very rare. Um, an awful lot of biting cases are fear, mm -hmm. um, which again can be a difficult concept to understand. You know, in that moment, the last thing the dog looks is afraid. Mm -hmm. um, if the dog is being very aggressive uh, and biting or, or snapping, mm -hmm. um, but uh, a lot of a lot of uh, aggression is fear aggression, mm -hmm. um, particularly because in in in, in the brain, uh, the the emotional centers for fear and uh, and rage are very closely linked. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so if a dog is very frightened, its go-to defense will often be rage. Uh, and likewise, actually, a dog that is very frustrated might also bite. So it's another mm -hmm. common form of, of biting is if uh, the dog is a bit frustrated. Mm -hmm. um, so if you have one of those dogs that seems to be uh, on the go all the time and, you know, a little bit, it uh, can be a bit crazy, a bit jumpy, really good idea to train uh, that dog to be uh, rewarded for calm things for, mm -hmm. for doing you know a lie down on a mat mm -hmm. um, or, or for again for doing a sit so that that kind of dog uh, doesn't learn uh, to bite when they're just frustrated right. uh, with things so th those are the two more common scenarios uh, dogs will bite if frightened mm -hmm. um, so again be aware with kids mm -hmm. um, if the dog looks frightened I, I do urge a lot of you guys out there with dogs to to uh, get into a little bit of, of canine uh, body language um, to study your dog and to understand the signals that your dog might give if they're not comfortable with something. Mm -hmm. um, common one, for example, is, is whale eye, where you see the white of the eye mm -hmm. in the dog. Mm -hmm. um, that's usually the earliest warning that dog's a little bit uncomfortable. So yeah. say, you know, a, a child's patting a dog on the head mm -hmm. like this, and the dog's pulling yeah. away, and you can see the whites of the eyes. Maybe the dog's turning their head. That's polite in dog language, uh, trying to say to the, the mm. child, you know, please go away. If the child ignores that, that's where you might get a nip, for example. Mm. Uh, but as, as the owner of mm. that dog, um, ha, you know, observing your dog, if you saw those signs, those early signs that your dog's uncomfortable, move the dog away, mm. you know, straight away, tell the child, you know, they can't. Yeah. I see Bev's just dipping in here saying, you know, if you back down when they're showing you aggression or, I mean, that's obviously a fear response, but if they're really squaring up to you, you won't be able to do, earn the dog's trust back. Is this sort of harking back to the old ideas of dominance and things like that? 
It, it is. It is. Again, as we said, um, with all bike cases, you have to have a, an individual assessment. Uh, mm -hmm. You must, because the first thing you have to understand is why is that dog biting? Mm -hmm. What is going on? Um, and said so there are very few cases of, of aggression for aggression's sake. Very, mm -hmm. very few. Vast majority said are, are fear. Mm -hmm. um, and we talk about backing down. Mm -hmm. um, you know this the dog is already frightened mm -hmm. um if you then square up to the dog if you start to to lean over the dog if you start to shout at the dog mm -hmm. or, if, or worse if you were to do something like you know to try and restrain the dog the dog is going to get more frightened mm -hmm. uh, and therefore likely is is going to increase the aggression so with a with a dog uh, in that kind of more extreme situation you really do need to back down mm -hmm. You need to allow the dog to calm down. Mm -hmm. um, if you can, of course, try and uh, contain the dog safely, but mm -hmm. don't not not restrain. Mm -hmm. So contain the dog uh, in a room, um, you know, or, or with a you know behind a baby gate or something like that. If, if it's a regular occurrence, if you have a dog that tends to do this regularly, then please, mm -hmm. it's safety first. Keep the dog safe somewhere and out of uh, you know remove its ability to harm a person. Mm -hmm. um, but anything uh, what's called aversive, anything that will cause the dog fear or pain mm -hmm. is going to increase the intensity of the aggression. Mm -hmm. um, so that is the, the, the least, uh, the worst parts that you can take, you're going to make it worse. I mean, so um, and if you do have that kind of aggression, you do need one-to-one -one, yeah. um, behavioral support. Really and they need to assess your house and make sure that everybody's mm -hmm. safe. I know when we used to, when I was in the army and we'd get a new handler through for, you know, they were thinking biters, really, I'd say they're dogs that have been trained yeah. to bite, uh, yeah. although a lot of them had come through Battersea, and, but actually the fear ones never made it into the lines, unfortunately, but when a new handler was taken yeah. over a dog, it was all about winning trust, taking time, building that bond, that, that sort of thing, it was never... It was never a dominance thing, you know. They never tried to Absolutely. just sort of, you know, stare them down or, like you say, stand over them. It, it was almost sitting, sitting with them next to them, you know, in the runs and just just building the bond. Really slow, um, gentle response to a dog like that. Mm. Uh, and also, you know, if you have a dog who is perhaps a, a, a complete sweetheart at home, mm -hmm. loves your family, but will lunge at, at maybe people or uh, other dogs outside. That That is quite a common issue. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we call it reactivity. Um, please train your dog to, to wear a muzzle. Um, mm -hmm. Great tool, great yeah. safety tool. Yeah. Takes the worry away from you, takes the worry from the mm -hmm. dog. Uh, there's a brilliant website called the Muzzle Up Project mm -hmm. that shows you how to train the dog to, to take a muzzle mm -hmm. uh, happily. Um, Yes, I do appreciate, you know, people on the street may look askance mm. sometimes, uh, but there is, again, a growing community that understands that muzzles are, you know, a good tool. Yeah. Some dogs need them. Some dogs have them for other reasons. Some dogs scavenge off the floor and they yeah. need a muzzle yeah, to stop yeah. them eating someone's like a kebab one or one. something. Yeah, yeah, fine. You can, you can cover them up in pretty tape if yeah. you like. Lots of people do that, you know, glitter like, tape and stuff. Um, but if you do have a dog that you think is a, a bite risk, uh, please train to a muzzle. Yeah. Um, obviously, from vet's point of view, preferable if the dog's going to be frightened. <laughs> um, but don't tell me <laughs> afterwards when he's hanging off yeah. my finger. Actually, I exactly. really like the, the, the yellow the yellow lead project as well. You know, this dog needs space, that sort of thing. But of course, the people who are most likely to get bitten are the people who don't know what that means. You know, so it's all of our responsibilities to keep other people safe. Yeah, and I think on the you know the yellow dog um, movement is, is fantastic. I have a yellow flag on my dog's lead, uh, and, and I need space. Uh, but as a general rule, I think you know it's not just dogs that are, are reactive. You know, if you see a dog on lead, especially if you're in a, a walk, mm -hmm. see a dog on lead, pop your own dog on lead. Walk past them on the lead, yeah. um, or if you don't want to do that, at least call your dog away mm -hmm. so they're well away from the other dog mm -hmm. uh, and, and give them a bit of room because there are many, many reasons why a dog might be on a lead mm -hmm. um, and not be able to be off the lead. Mm -hmm. uh, there are many reasons why another dog may want not want another dog to approach them yeah. or the owner. Mm -hmm. um, and so just general etiquette is to yeah. say, you know, put your dog on lead if you see one on lead. Brilliant. I, I think we could talk about biting and aggression all night long to be honest we could probably talk about most things all night long but i'm, I'm, go I'm going to move on now um 
there are a lot of questions asking about barking so I'd, I'd like to talk about that and then we'll move on to sort of uh, separation anxiety loss of you know other dogs in the house that that sort of thing and maybe a bit of bonding mm -hmm. and, and stuff um so barking people saying here you know if we go through this you know my i have a five month old highland puppy's adorable put him in his pen he will not stop barking we know that uh where yeah. else Bark, barking is my issue too jumping up at people barking at everything but especially the tv how do you stop a dog barking excessively when the door knocks or the post comes through the letterbox so yeah um barking obviously a big issue where, where, where do we start <laughs> yeah. i had a dog that big used issue. to bark once, yeah so. big big issue big topic um bark, barking is arousal mm. you know the dog's aroused uh, wants to uh, wants something is trying to you know get attention try and ask in his puppy to, to please let me out mm -hmm. uh, or it's just over excited you know the doorbell's gone so it means people are coming excitement excitement I'm gonna bark uh, dogs bark uh, out of boredom mm -hmm. dogs bark out of fear again um, so the first thing with barking is to understand why is the dog barking because mm -hmm. uh, we get back to the what is the dog wanting mm -hmm. and how can we let the dog have that thing without this problem barking mm -hmm. going on um so one typical scenario of that would be for example barking at the at the door mm -hmm. uh, so the doorbell goes uh the dog probably wants to well it might be either guarding your house mm -hmm. um or the dog wants to go and greet the person at the door because they're sociable and they want to go and say hi to the exciting thing that's coming through the door mm -hmm. um for both of those scenarios, uh, it's a good idea to teach the dog an alternative thing to do when the doorbell goes. And mm -hmm. an awful lot of behavior treatment actually is, is teaching a different r response mm -hmm. to what's happening. Okay. Um, so uh, a good method is to teach your dog to either go to the bed or if the bed's too far away, go to a little piece of you know mat or a carpet on the floor when the doorbell rings, mm -hmm. um, and you would build that up over time. So mm -hmm. you'd first of all you know get this mat or the bed and and teach the dog to go to it. Might pop a little bit of chicken on it so the dog sits on it, and if he sits on it, boy, you know mm -hmm. a bit more chicken so that he learns that the uh, the mat is a great place to go, and then you can gradually build that up. Um, and if it's with doorbell ringing, you can uh, phones are great record your, your doorbell on the phone, mm. you know, play it on a video quietly, mm. dogs on the mat, chicken, mm. oh, you know, doorbell went, but I didn't move, I got chicken. And you build up this association slowly, adding mm. more um, sound to it, so mm. uh, making the doorbell a bit louder, and ultimately the real doorbell and Mr. Friend to ring the door and you're by the dog, you reward them for staying on the mat, mm. then you go to the door. Um, but you build up this association that when the bell rings, I don't, bark mm -hmm. i do sit on my mat literally almost pavlovian um, reaction it, it absolutely you are exactly you're, you're conditioning the dog to love the mat and to understand that therefore you know if that dog is guarding then mm -hmm. you've told the dog it's fine mm -hmm. uh, I, I actually i you know my chihuahua little as he is they are a guard breed mm -hmm. um that would have been their job mm -hmm. <laughs> uh very alert uh, when the doorbell goes i say thank you Mm -hmm. So I, I've taught him the cue, thank you, uh -huh. which is saying, I've heard it, mm -hmm. it's not an issue. I say it in a happy voice, like, mm -hmm. thank you, give him a treat. I have treats all around the house, a little pot on my desk, mm -hmm. uh, and he stops barking. Mm -hmm. He stops barking because he's understood, he's told me, he's done his job, I've got it, you don't need to carry on barking. So you do need to look at each individual case, but mm -hmm. essentially you're working with dogs and saying, what is it that you want? So he wants to tell me there's someone at the door, I acknowledge that. Mm -hmm. He gets rewarded. The dog that is is concerned or that wants to run to the door use the mat training. You know they're no longer running or rushing at the door um, mm -hmm. when your visitors come. Um, and likewise, it's a good method for those impulsive dogs that we talked about before mm -hmm. that tend to jump up, etc. If you told them to go to their mat and then you know they can calmly come and greet the visitors come mm -hmm. in, they're ultimately getting what they wanted. Mm -hmm. um, they're just not getting it from barking. So mm -hmm. it's you know don't do this, do that instead you get the thing that you want okay that's that's interesting i mean you yeah. know we, we look at sort of the, the way the human brain works and you know we they say we have this very initial fast sort of 
reptilian emotional response and then sort of lagging behind that a couple of seconds later is our sort of slower more logical response and you know yeah. these emotional responses are really deeply baked into us and the more we do them the, the deeper those neural pathways become is that a problem when you're dealing with dogs in that i guess is there more of an emotional response and less of the sort of logical rational response and does that then feed into how you try and and change or condition these responses um it's certainly a factor in that um there is no magic bullet to a lot of these issues that we're talking about um and uh people who who say they will cure your dog of barking for example within mm. one go uh, unfortunately they're probably using the methods we were talking about earlier the dominant methods they're using things that will cause the dog to feel very frightened mm -hmm. and they may stop barking, mm -hmm. but they're now terrified. Severe um, yeah. And all the issues that can come. So in in training, we are forming new neural pathways. So mm -hmm. we, we are forming a neural pathway that is, you know, I do not respond to this trigger, bell, with barking. I respond to this trigger with going to my mat. Mm -hmm. um, so we have to keep repeating and reinforcing it. That's why all of these uh, new behaviors need a lot of training. Mm. Um, and if you have a dog that is habitually barking, the other thing we need to do is not allow them to keep practicing and reinforcing the old neuro neural pathway. So, you know, mm. if you have a dog that tends to rush at the door when visitors come, use a baby gate to stop it. Mm. You know, just, just put some prevention in place so you don't have to stop it. Mm. So that is one side of, of um, uh, the, the sort of neural part of, of training. The other side, yes, is that um, uh, dog cognition is not as, as, as complex as ours. Mm. Um, and uh, particularly dogs that tend to be more uh, impulsive. Now, those dogs uh, from studies have shown to be uh, more extrovert type dogs tend to be quite impulsive so they do before they think mm -hmm. um, and also more neurotic dogs will tend to do before they think you know mm -hmm. ones that worry and that perhaps will, will bark or lunge at something uh, mm -hmm. that they find uh, frightening so uh, particularly with those dogs you are working with a brain chemistry that that responds very quickly mm -hmm. um, and the more the the dog uh, responds to it in the way that you don't want them to mm -hmm. the stronger that reaction gets mm -hmm. um, and interestingly often more generalized especially in the case of fear mm -hmm. um, so say your dog starts off and um, it is bitten by a black dog mm -hmm. um, or a very fluffy dog the dog mm -hmm. may initially be a bit frightened of other fluffy dogs mm -hmm. and may start to bark at those um, but if it's sort of barking and lunging at, at the fluffy type dogs isn't um, you know you, you don't manage that behavior you don't take steps to help mm. the dog feel more reassured about the, the appearance of other mm. dogs they will start to generalize that to other dogs and become less and less accurate mm. um, and that can even start to then generalizing to furry hats mm. somebody in a furry coat mm. <laughs> you know they, they they start to get literally quite trigger happy they will see something that looks a bit like a dog mm. and we'll react to that as well so mm. that that's an aspect of um how it, our brains work like that as well it's we, how you get yeah, policemen shooting people for a, having a wallet in their hand or a mobile phone yeah. if they think it's a gun you know we, we can we can uh, when frightened uh, mm. repeatedly we can become less accurate mm. um but it's a problem for dogs too uh, and and it's why if, if you've got any kind of problem behavior try and stop the dog from doing it first in, mm. in as humane a way as you can usually it means sort of prevention baby gates or you know mm. having the dog on lead so they can't run up at people mm. um so they can't keep practicing these these mm. bad behaviors and reinforcing those neural pathways yeah i mean it's important to recognize that these emotions that they get i mean sort of an algorithmical way of thinking isn't it? it's an automatic process and so fear is evolved as a protective mechanism you know they're protecting Absolutely. themselves they're their bond, you know, partners, sibling, you know, offspring, that sort of thing. So, you know, these yeah. are normal things with abnormal consequences, I guess, or undesirable consequences. Undesirable. I mean, the, uh, you know, in terms of an automatic response, an unthinking response by a dog, if a dog's unsure, they, they may actually show a little bit of regression initially mm -hmm. just to try and get a sense of, you know, how are you going to react? Are you safe? Mm -hmm. So uh, sometimes if you see a dog posturing or, or you know snarling or growling, 
they may actually be uncertain in that sort of point of time and they're trying to understand the situation that that's their emotional response mm -hmm. uh and and just trying to see how you're going to react mm -hmm. um now of course you know if a dog in that situ situation you know it's not sure it's a bit of in conflict and then experiences some kind of aggression back mm -hmm. you know the person shouts the other dog you know mm -hmm. lunges at them they're going to learn a fear response in that moment quite a powerful fear response and that means that next time they the situation occurs they're going to go straight to their more aggressive uh, reaction nice. they said almost unthinkingly because it's been that pathway has been formed mm -hmm. Uh, in the brain and uh, and that's how they're going to respond so mm. calmness in in dog training is is really essential uh, and and uh, as humans taking that cognitive mm. opportunity to step back and go why did the dog do that yeah, yeah. You know, that what's can, happening that can be tough can't it as well when things aren't aren't happening i mean i always liken it to you know uh, didn't everyone get drunk and was sick on cider at the age of 18 and then no one can drink <laughs> yeah, cider yeah. again because you know that's a real you know stuff that makes us sick uh, is a really strong uh yeah. learning stimulus within within our brain and, and fear is the same if you get frightened of something Absolutely. when you're younger you know that is instantly going to provoke um, negative reactions when you see it the next time you know, have you got any Absolutely. tips for people when something like that happens and you just feel angry or frustrated or, you know, you just want to strangle somebody? You know, what can you do to kind of just, you know, I always remember an old trainee say to me, the bigger the poo, the bigger the smile. You know, what, what, <laughs> what, what can you do to just kind of suppress that and let the logic take over and say, you know, I've got to behave calmly at this point. Otherwise, bad things are going to happen in my training of my dog. Yeah, I, I think for, first up is, is don't react. So as, as long as the situation is safe, mm -hmm. um, you know, as long as no one is about to get hurt, mm -hmm. you know, just stop mm -hmm. for a minute. Because probably the best thing you can do in that moment to buy yourself some thinking time, but also not to do something that is going to further, you know, rile the dog or frighten the dog, whatever the situation is, is, is to stop for a moment. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then to have that curious mindset. Mm. To, to think as a next question, why? Mm -hmm. um, and certainly to start to look around and try and recall uh, as accurate as you can what just happened mm -hmm. before, mm -hmm. what was going on just before, and what did the dog do? Mm -hmm. um, and also actually have you potentially seen that somewhere else before but maybe not as extreme? Mm -hmm. uh, and perhaps you didn't notice it. So it, it's curiosity and, and fact finding mm -hmm. rather than anger or, or even fear. You know, said as long as no one is is uh, hurt or about to get hurt, you do have the time to step back mm -hmm. and ask that why question and to take in what you're seeing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and it's also helpful, you know, if, if this behavior does become an ongoing problem and you're going to work with a behaviorist with it, the more information you can give them, the more specific information you can give them, the more likely it is that you're going to resolve this this issue mm. um, successfully because okay. you are beginning to understand what was the trigger. Mm -hmm. um, and for some dogs, it can be very specific. Some some dogs are, are very sort of relaxed and they don't mind, and other dogs that they, they have certain things they don't like. You know, quite a few dogs don't like being patted on the head. Mm -hmm. We often do it to dogs. <laughs> <laughs> them. Um, a lot of dogs really don't like it, especially if they don't know the person. Mm. They, they find it really, you know, uncomfortable. It frightens some dogs. Mm. Um, sometimes it can, or you know, some dogs don't like it if you lean over them. Mm. So sometimes you wonder why, you know, you, you were saying hello to a lovely dog and suddenly jumps up and does what's called an air snap. Mm. Uh, now an air snap is actually relatively polite behaviour in a dog's land. It's the dog saying, I "Could have bitten you." But I didn't. Mm -hmm. But I was warning you. Mm -hmm. um, and often that is simply because we were leaning over the dog, mm -hmm. uh, and, and the dog perceived that to be quite threatening and responded. So um, be aware of, of body uh, as well as what's going on around you. If your mm -hmm. dog suddenly done something, dogs rarely do things um, out the blue. You mm -hmm. often get, you know, you know, my my dog was in, and they suddenly bit, or they suddenly mm -hmm. did this. Usually, that there's there's been a trigger, mm -hmm. um, probably one has happened before, mm -hmm. um, or the dog was already stressed. So there's uh, the other thing to consider is, you know, if the dog's had a bad day, mm -hmm. you know, there's something called trigger stacking where, mm -hmm. you know, dogs 
and I you dropped a pan in the morning on the floor and it clattered and it frightened the dog a bit and then they went out and you know you were in a bit of a mood and you were pulling them a bit more than than often they got a bit frustrated mm -hmm. and then they saw the neighbors you know dog that they don't like and they barked a bit mm -hmm. get home and somebody you know suddenly shouts and the dog mm -hmm. reacts badly but that dog has had its stress levels building mm -hmm. all yeah. day yeah. Um, and, and there's a limit and the dog then suddenly snaps but it, there's nothing sudden about it the, do, the dog's had stresses so be being nice alive to, to those kind of things as well but yeah just, just stop what you're doing and think why is mm. my okay, that's, that's main really response interesting. I'd never heard of trigger stacking before but that makes total sense yeah, um, yeah we, we do it too you know, yeah, sure back down in the office and then you go and yell at someone in the car <laughs> you know, we, try, we trigger stack yeah, yeah, I can see that. I can see that. Um, so I, I want to come on. I can't believe it's like it's quarter to nine already. I so um, uh, I want to come on to separation. Well, anxiety, separation, anxiety, grief. And, you know, from making a video a couple of weeks ago, uh, you know, I, I talked about this concept of how, how hard it is because we're constantly we're almost you know, we do our training and then we say end of training and we go and we do what we did before and we reinforce the old behaviours again. So mm -hmm. before we come on separation anxiety, I, I want to talk about, you know, how hard is it to um, detrain these neural pathways? And is there anything that we can do when the dog is younger, when you first have them to put in place protective mechanisms or, or get them kind of, you know, trained along the lines that you want them to be? I mean, we always talk about up, up to that 16 weeks uh, of age that's when dogs are more in, uh, inquisitive and more likely mm -hmm. to have a positive to reaction to things is that 16 week thing a myth is there anything else that we could be doing with our young dogs I know rescue dogs can be a bit more tricky sometimes yeah so so you can always uh, retrain a dog there's no age limit mm -hmm. uh, to, to say uh, first up um, and um, you know, well, whilst things don't take, uh, don't ha tend to happen overnight, you, you can train in a new behaviour. And I, and I think to answer the question around, you know, how difficult is it? You can make it a lot easier on yourself if you can stop the thing that you didn't want happening from happening. Now I know sometimes that's not possible, but if you can possibly prevent the dog from doing it, so perhaps by using a baby gate, if your dog tends to say rush out the door or if the dog barks at the window, cover the window with some kind of opaque film or even just paper for a while so they can't see things outside. If your dog barks because of noises, for example, play music so they can't hear those noises. Whatever the, the issue is, if you can find a way um, to just prevent it from happening by the way you set up your house and, and the way you set up your life, mm -hmm. then um, you're already stopping uh, a lot of the behavior in that the the, the reinforced pathways mm -hmm. will begin to deteriorate on their own mm -hmm. um, and uh, ultimately we can get to what's called extinction which is when a behavior stops um, because you you prevent it from happening or mm -hmm. uh, and in parallel you train the dog to do something else so jumping mm -hmm. up is a classic one if your dog jumps up at you don't want them to so you've got a rescue dog and it's just in the habit of you know leaping up joyously to lick you in the face but you don't want it to mm -hmm. um if when you uh, and say the dog likes a ball to be thrown through them as they they come towards you throw the ball on the floor they go and fetch the ball they bring it to you you play a bit of fetch mm -hmm. you've extinguished the jumping up immediately mm -hmm. they had no reason to jump up because you threw the ball before you you know they did um, and you've trained in an incompatible behavior, which is playing a bit of fetch mm -hmm. for them to come and greet you. And then eventually the dog's going to come and greet you, you can give a pat, etc., and they can mm -hmm. say hi. So sometimes you've got to be a bit creative, um, but step one would be, you know, how can you stop the dog doing what it was doing or discourage it in a, in a humane way? Um, because that will help with the training. Um, with uh, very young dogs, um, certainly that the 16-week thing is not a myth. It, it, it's a very important uh, period in a puppy's life. It's when they learn most of what they, uh, most of their social circle, what they will find normal, mm -hmm. and, and by that I mean not scary, mm -hmm. um, is happens in those 16 weeks. Mm -hmm. um, so if you have a puppy within the 16 week window, um, or you're you're going to get a puppy, uh, please you know take time off work. 
I mean, it's a, it's a fantastic time anyway, mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. but take some time off work and less friends, etc. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, encourage that puppy to experience lots of different things, including taking the pup to a vet a few times. You know, it could yeah. even be just yeah. on a, a play date mm-hmm. or a puppy party. Yeah. Um, but you know, get your dog out and about. Um, have lots of little food tidbits with you to reward the dog so that, mm-hmm. you know, if you see something he's not sure about, you can give him a bit of food to him and say, Lay. you know, they associate it with something positive. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, expose them to lots of things in a non-scary way. So something as simple as, you know, if you've got a, a black rug- rubbish sack that we mm-hmm. typically put our, our rubbish in, you know, when you're doing bin day, just pop it on the floor, let the dog approach it, mm-hmm. give it a sniff. Um, if they're happy, you know, maybe give it a bit of a waggle so it makes a funny noise. All these little things are great learning experiences. And if they can, if the puppy experiences those in a positive way, they're mm-hmm. not frightened by them and they're allowed to explore these things of their own volition. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, hoovers and things that make noise. Mm-hmm. Uh, the more you can expose your dog in, in a positive way to different types of stimulus, different types of people, different animals. Mm-hmm. Um, handling is another thing with young puppies. Please, you know, handle them all over. Mm-hmm. You know, gently fill their paws, gently put your fingers in their ears, mm-hmm. you know, put your fingers in their gums. These are all things they need to be used to mm-hmm. uh, and understand they're not frightening. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that they get used to all of this weird human stuff that we do and all these weird human things that we have, you know, car journeys, mm. buses, trains, get them out on those uh, makes a big difference to, mm. to a puppy's life if they can be exposed to those. Um, I said, if you do have a rescue, though, you know, that there, there are uh, ways of, of desensitizing a, a dog if they mm. are frightened of things. Again, I would recommend getting a, a behaviorist in, but so you've got a, a rescue and you've discovered that they're mortally afraid of traffic cones for some reason. Mm-hmm. Um, you can desensitize them to, to traffic cones over time. Mm-hmm. Um, you would use distance first. Mm-hmm. So have a traffic cone a very long way away, let mm-hmm. the dog see it and give them a reward. Gradually bring the traffic cone closer. Mm-hmm. You would desensitize them in that way um, and then let them hang out a bit longer in the presence mm-hmm. of the, the traffic cone. But there are ways to help even adult dogs that appear to have perhaps some irrational mm. problems like fear of traffic cones, that is a mm. real thing, um, that you can help them through this this desensitization process and, yeah. uh, and then some counter conditioning that helps them to understand that that thing is not scary. So mm. if you've got a dog, especially if you've got a rescue dog and you, you suspect perhaps they didn't have the best start in life, they didn't get socialized to all these different experiences, you, you can still help them. And, and, um, and, and teach them. Ange has a great saying for this, which is, "Take the time it takes, so it takes less time." Exactly, exactly, you know, exactly, exactly, exactly. And yeah. and uh, yeah. I, I mean, I, I I've often thought as well, well. You know, you look at people, and you know, people have problems with phobias and and you know being scared of things. And you know, I, I believe you know there there are two psychological systems. When we look at something scary, we can either decide to, you know, we, the anxiety never gets less. We perhaps just get a little bit braver at approaching it and and learning from it. But as soon as we flip over into that sort of uh aggressive defensive response to something that's fearful you you've kind of lost it you know it's an entirely different yeah. brain system kicking in at that point so uh, absolutely and you said you get that inaccuracy coming in that generalization suddenly more things will become scary or frightening mm. rather than fewer um yeah. so you can really trigger a, a bit of a cascade yeah yeah. Um, through that and I think the other thing and maybe sort of getting on to the, the separation anxiety mm-hmm. question as well this is when dogs uh, are, you know don't or can't be left by their owners get very mm-hmm. clingy uh, sometimes destructive if they are left um, as uh, the owner of a young dog or a new dog to the family um, one often overlook aspect of, of training your new dog is to teach them that it's okay to be alone Mm-hmm. So with a puppy, definitely training the pup that there are times when you know they need to amuse themselves, mm-hmm. that there won't be contact, uh, that they need to you know trust that you're coming back. Mm-hmm. Um, I like crates for this reason. A crate, mm-hmm. crate is a great tool in, in teaching a dog uh, to understand to settle. Mm-hmm. Um, you can put settle on cue mm-hmm. and say you know I, I say go sleepies to my dog mm-hmm. when he's in his crate and. He turns around a few times and he goes to sleep and he knows I'm coming back. Yeah. 
Um, but I'm going out and I'm not concerned, you know, that he's uh, worried. So I think with, with especially with pups, teaching them to settle and mm. teaching them alone time, um, creating a safe space for them, somewhere mm. they're happy to hang out with a comfortable bed, that it's the temperature that they like, mm -hmm. with toys and things like that that they can play with, or, you know, Kongs, these, these mm -hmm. uh, toys that you can stuff with food. Um, these are all good ways to, to teach a dog to, to be happy alone and, mm -hmm. uh, and to settle down and be calm and not worry that you're not around. Fantastic. Um, really important. Um, I, I wanted to come on now to a question uh, that's been posed a couple of times about grief, um, you know, dogs grieving, loss of a pack member uh well, you know comes to us all and you know it comes to our dogs as well that unfortunately sometimes they yeah. they pass away or, or we have to take them in and it's often a very difficult time for us and yes. um you know it's clearly a, a difficult time from what i've seen with, with, with dogs as well now i'm often unsure as to how much of it is grief at the loss of a, a pack member how much of it is sort of reforming of social bonds and so how much of it is um just you know picking up on our emotion as well um is there anything we mm. can do to help them you know we i often say you know if you can let the other dogs see the you know their their, their departed pack member before before they uh they're taken away is, is there anything else that we can do to help dogs that are missing you know they, they, maybe their pack members just disappeared in the middle of the night yeah, yeah. So I mean, the, the, dogs do grieve. Um, so we we know from um, uh, you know, uh, analysing the brain that dogs have uh, the, the same sort of uh, emotional centre that we do um, for uh, what is uh, a panic slash grief. They're the same centre, mm -hmm. um, and it is triggered by a, a sense of abandonment. So they, they feel they have been abandoned by, mm -hmm. you know, the person or the dog. Um, it, it, it stems from uh, when, they, when the dog is a very, very young pup. Mm -hmm. um, if the mother is, is absent for any period of time, the, 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 the pup will feel her, you know, that she's not there, that sense that uh, the pup's been abandoned and will vocalise to, to call the mother back mm -hmm. and to tell the mother that, you know, they, they want them. Um, and, and so... Um, this form of, of panic that happens, uh, and, and in some cases genuine grief, uh, mm. especially if it is the loss, uh, the, the death of a uh, another uh, pet that the dog particularly liked, or the, the owner, mm. it happens uh, mm. with dogs where the owner has passed away, um, is genuine. Um, and it is um, a, I said, a, a form of panic that, uh, that the person is, is, is not there anymore and they feel abandoned. Um, and 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 have the feelings of panic that that we would associate to. Um, mm -hmm. So you know, great amount of anxiety mm -hmm. can be caused in a dog um, that is uh, you know missing an owner or missing a a, a member of the family that's no longer there. Mm -hmm. um, in in milder cases, we might see it where the dog um, you know maybe sort of stares at the spot where the, the person left so mm -hmm. you know if the person went through the, the front door they might hang around the front door for ages just looking at the front door um as you get to to more uh, you know bigger instances of this kind of panic the dog may uh, go off their food might be very clingy mm -hmm. um and in more extreme cases the dog can become uh, destructive again this dog is panicking so if you have a dog that's got very severe separation anxiety uh, for for a reason, they may you know chew through things, chew through doors and things to try get out. Mm -hmm. uh, they may chew their paws. Unfortunately, we see some cases of of self mutilation in dogs that have got yeah. separation anxiety. So it can be a, a really serious problem, um, and I think particularly challenging for for owners when it comes at a time when th they've lost a dog, they themselves are grieving. The other dog starts to behave in ways that is worrying. It stops eating, very clingy, um, and it and it can be a worrying time uh, mm -hmm. for for the owner. Mm -hmm. um, in in terms of managing separation anxiety, again, it, it can depend on the severity. Mm -hmm. um, if uh, you are facing a situation where you have an older dog and you think uh, it, it may soon be the time that you decide that you're you're going to you know uh, let the dog go um then you can prepare 
for the scenario and I said actually coming back to the idea of teaching the other dog that alone time is is not a terrible thing mm -hmm. um, so gradually introducing perhaps a separate bedding area we said that you've made super nice very comfortable that can be a good way to to help the dog mm -hmm. um, to to settle down and teaching the dog to settle in there giving the dog sort of a massage or mm -hmm. a nice you know really tasty a chew toy or something um, is a good preventative way Mm -hmm. uh, to, to begin to help the dog to cope better without its body. You know, mm -hmm. often when we have two dogs or more, we, we have them for companion mm -hmm. and we keep them together all the time. Mm -hmm. um, but that can cause a problem if the other dog has to go away. So if you've got a multi-dog household, if you can, get the dogs used to being alone as, as well as being together mm -hmm. so that you, you have less of this cause. If you're in a situation where it's sudden, um, if the dog's extreme, there is medication. Mm -hmm. um, John, as you know, which would have to be discussed with the vet, it's always worth telling your vet if you have had a, a death or a, an absence in the family, then the vet's informed mm -hmm. um, in case uh, the dog would benefit from medication that will help them to feel a bit calmer, to mm -hmm. cope a little bit better, um, and then you can start the training um, to, to support the dog. Um, and the training, uh, it, you can't put a time frame on it, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, it can take some time, but you essentially begin to train the to dog to tolerate your absence mm -hmm. a little bit better. So and if the dog's been very clinic, that's how you, you, you build up uh, to the point where the dog can tolerate you going. Mm -hmm. And just to jump in there on the medication, mm -hmm. you know, for me, the medication is not a solution. It's, uh, it enables, it's a, it's a it enables <clears throat> training, you know, it yes. puts them in a, in a, in a receptive uh frame of mind to be trained absolutely and if if um if a behaviorist is working uh, with somebody um we have to discuss uh medication with the vet um mm -hmm. so it might make an owner aware that it's mm -hmm. a possibility the dog might benefit from medication in order to start training mm -hmm. so that the dog is in uh, is in an emotional place where mm -hmm. they can cope um, but the vet would always be the one to prescribe and to decide what uh, mm. and if uh, the medication uh, mm. should be started for how long um, uh, and discuss with the behaviourist what the plan is to help modify the behaviour while the dog is, mm. is beginning to, to recuperate. So um, if, if anybody's in that situation now, they've had a sudden loss, uh, the dog appears to be really not coping, you know, is, is, is you know, perhaps very restless, not eating well, um, you know, please visit the vet first and, mm. and have that discussion um, and get a recommendation for a local behaviourist who can come and, and, and work with you at home and set the dog up mm. uh, so that you can begin this training for the dog to sort of be rehabilitated to mm. being alone mm. um, uh, without this sort of extreme response. Mm. Um, but as I said, you can't put a time frame. Some dogs uh, manage to bounce back relatively quickly with some it can take some time mm. um and while the dog is that anxious uh highly recommended that the dog is not left alone if you can possibly manage it with you know mm. house rotors friends coming in dog sitter day sitter something like that so that mm. the dog isn't left alone because a dog that is uh, that has separation anxiety that is panicked or grieving in this way um it will be made worse mm. by prolonged absences um you know they, they have to be able to to build up to tolerating that so you, you okay. need to give them company okay. um, and comfort them you can't make the dog worse by comforting them that's the number one <laughs> so <laughs> if they need a huggle give them a huggle um, you you know, need they, they, they need it yeah and for owners you know the the blue cross have a bereavement helpline yeah. you can call so if you yourself are struggling often mm -hmm. you know said it hits a time when when emotionally you're, you're struggling to then um the blue cross is great that you can talk to somebody you can write to them um and they have a free service for for owners okay. who are going through bereavement and and i think I'd, 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 i i want to uh, plug lynn's uh bereavement clinics that she do, that she does here at the clinic um where she will um you know if we know we're going to lose a pet in the next week or two please 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 come in and see lynn because lynn can help yeah. um go through a few of these things and make what is a really difficult time um really uh a little bit easier because pe some people who don't have dogs they don't appreciate you know just how much they are a family mm. member it, it can be you know 
you know, very, very uh, painful for us and, and for those, um, for the other dogs. Um, it's, it's five past nine. Can I, can I ask you a couple more questions, Nats? Is that all yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes, and there was so Mark and Council remember we need to answer, yeah. I, uh, I, I wanted to um, chat a little bit about marking in the house, mm. pooing and peeing, and a little bit about castration with regards to marking secondary sexual characteristics and also uh, secondary sexual behaviours, but also whether you think that, you know, again, some people do reach for castration as a sort of a cure-all for marking and that sort of thing. So... Yeah, uh, uh, just sort of a more general question about what do you do with dogs that are marking in the house? What's causing it? And what do you think of some of the solutions like castration for that mm -hmm. and as a solution for other behavioral mm -hmm. issues? Yeah. So uh, again comes uh, number one, why is the dog marking? So that why question is back. Um, is it normal marking behavior? Um, and by normal, I mean, is, is the dog simply um, being stimulated by, by smell? So um, if uh, one dog has peed in the house and the other dog can smell it, they may just pee over the top, mm -hmm. as they do outside, as you see them going along every lamppost. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this is male and female dogs. Mm -hmm. um, so if, if there is some kind of stimulus in the house, if another dog is peeing uh, or if they can smell urine, um, that's actually normal marking behavior mm. um, and uh, it, it management is the way forward with that kind of thing and that that's often uh, that's a very common scenario mm. that kind of marking behavior is very common um, you, you need to clean up um, don't use bleach mm. it uh, I can't remember what it is but it, it smells similar to, to dog urine so dogs may mark again mm. um, you need an enzyme cleaner so mm. clean up as best you can use an enzyme cleaner really neutralize the area mm. um, block the area off as well you know even if temporarily get you mm. know puppy pens are great just to block all areas of the house or put something down that, that the dog can't get near um, and um, if the dog, uh, you know, marks nearby or persists, go back to, to puppy training, house training again. Mm. Um, uh, you know, really can't harm to just go back to, if you remember when you had the dog as a pup, every time they went out for a, a wee or a poo outside, you know, you went crazy with joy and you gave them lots of, you know, fuss and maybe some food treats um, and told them that you're really, really happy, really mm. happy that they went outside. Mm. Um, so if you've got an adult dog that's, that seems to be reverting to a bit of this marking, you know, do try the, the sort of simple, you know, go back to the training steps, go back to sort of taking the dog out regularly, mm -hmm. praising them heavily for, for going, because that could resolve the marking issue along with the, you know, the, the keeping things uh, clean indoors. Mm -hmm. um, there are other um, reasons for, for marking. Um, sometimes dogs will do it because they're overexcited. Mm -hmm. Sometimes dogs that are very submissive might suddenly whittle or, or defecate even. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, so we're talking about um, arousal issues again. Mm -hmm. So with those dogs, understanding why is the dog so, um, you know, so aroused, so overexcited, calm the dog's life down, try and find ways to, to keep that dog calmer, um, look at their lifestyle, they're getting enough sleep. Mm -hmm. You know, are, are they, you know, they, are, they, are they being disturbed by something? Is something frightening them? Try and understand, or, or are they, are they one of these impulsive type dogs, extrovert type dogs, in which case train things that teach them a little bit of patience mm -hmm. um, so that, you know, they don't get this sort of surge of excitability that can sometimes mm -hmm. lead to that kind of problem, problem marking. Um, and, of course, a, a vet check is advised you know the dog might have uh, a bladder infection might be uh, have some other form of incontinence mm. uh, can happen obviously as a result of age spaying mm. so john i'm getting to your yeah. territory but there could be a medical reason um sure. why a dog might be um how about stresses within the house you know uh, if there is a certain amount of fear or new dog new cat new baby male dog it can yeah, it can cause marking. It, it, it can exactly, and, and new arrivals uh, generally. New arrivals are quite stressful for dogs. I think we we assume they're just going to love everything and, and get on with it. And you know, the, you can have scenarios where the dog is very stressed by the arrival of another dog, or a different animal, or a baby. You know, babies. Mm -hmm. You know, sound funny. Suddenly, routine has changed mm -hmm. for a dog. Uh, that can have a really big impact. And and sometimes you can get this kind of marking. You know, as a 
as a sort of attention seeking behavior mm. um again because it's highly effective <laughs> dog mm. starts weighing everybody's suddenly looking at the dog mm. um so understanding the, un- the underlying why um mm. uh, is a good way to deal with with marking that isn't um doesn't seem to have a sort of more obvious trigger like you know the dog's peed there and they're just copying uh, mm. and peeing over the top um so that is that is the, the primary route for a behaviorist to understand what what's going on and, and to try and address that root cause um because of that castration is not the panacea it seems um it doesn't in some cases it does stop marking mm-hmm. in some cases it increases it mm-hmm. so um if you are relying on the castration mm-hmm. to stop the the marking um you're taking quite a big gamble and it may not um and you're still better off going back to that um initial analysis of, of why is the dog doing it what's happening uh, and how mm-hmm. can we address that root cause um uh, you know before you go to castration as uh, as a sort of default um mm-hmm. correction it, it, it may not you may not get the result that you want i i am um, we i do see a few people come through the surgery where they've been advised to get their dog castrated for behavioral reason abc and I must admit, I'm I'm always a little bit cautious about it, um, mm. you know. I, and I try and steer people down the, you know, there there are these implants now that we can use mm-hmm. Supraline, mm-hmm. which you know can 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 chemically yeah. castrate for you know twelve twenty four months. But is there any sort of behavioural issue or set of issues that you tend to say, look, before we do anything, you need to castrate this dog, or actually, do you think? That castration is, like you say, it's, it's not a panacea. It, it you know, it, it might be useful sometimes, but ultimately it can be quite a risky strategy. Yeah, I certainly wouldn't recommend it as a behavioural strategy. Um, it, it could only then be done in consultation with the vet, um, who again will not be able to give guarantees that this is going to help Mm -hmm. um as you said with male dogs you do have the chemical castration route so essentially you know you have that it mimics the effect of castration but the dog's not actually castrated Mm -hmm. um in case of of aggression because some people do there is the myth out there that uh aggressive dogs will become less aggressive if Mm -hmm. they're castrated um same with spaying um, there, there are studies that show that sometimes uh, owner-directed aggression can increase mm-hmm. in dogs that have been um, castrated. So it's yeah, it's it's just a lottery. It it does help some dogs. That you know, we we have studies mm-hmm. to show it can help. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it you know we don't know enough about uh, the set of circumstances as to why it helped that dog with all of these things like any any kind of studies on on living beings there are so many variables that yeah. can't be controlled for we we can't categorically say uh, from a scientific point of view that, that you know this was definitively castration that mm. led to the dog being you know marking less or being less aggressive mm. uh, because other things might have happened even, even the owner believing that the castration helps might have stopped the owner from doing something the dog found fit you yes. know frightening and the dog stops because you know that the trigger has stopped so mm. um yeah, yeah I, certainly someone's been told it's going to help mm. i would be cautious and say um you know, it, it, it's worth looking at. If they don't want to castrate their dog anyway, you know, it's worth looking at other avenues before yeah. you go that route. Yeah, I, I, and yeah. certainly I, I always say no guarantees can be given, you know. Contrary to popular belief, men don't just think with their testicles. <laughs> well, not all <laughs> men anyway. <clears throat> um, okay, so right, quarter, quarter past nine now. We, we've, we've really gone through a, a lot of stuff here and I realise there are lots and lots of questions on here that we've not actually uh really answered in huge personal detail but uh we try to cover sort of the areas that 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 uh that we should be going on i'm just having a little look around around here um um final one um i tell you what we'll do we'll do one final sort of broad topic and whilst 
whilst Nancy's kindly answering this, if you could just, if you've got any one liner answers that you want, just post them in the comments and we'll try and do those really rapid fire at the end. So, uh, chewing. I, I want to talk about chewing, you know, puppies, older dogs, destructive behavior. Um, causes and solutions, please, Nancy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you've got five minutes. Number one, number one cause, human error. Oh, right. Um, okay. It was there. Yeah. So the dog chewed it. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Dogs don't know the difference between, or initially they don't know the difference between your slipper and their dog toy, or mm. um, they don't know that that is an expensive wooden dining room, you know, room table mm -hmm. that they've chewed because they're not taught that you know which things come from IKEA and which things don't. So mm. they, um, you have to teach your dog, you know, boundaries. So we're getting back to that polite behaviour when they're younger, teaching them calmness. Um, and certainly with any young dog, uh, puppy, young dog, and uh, rescue dogs, keep them in an area where they're not going to make the mistake of chewing something they shouldn't. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, create an area in the house where the dog can hang out, where their bed is, they've got water, they've got toys there that they, you know, choose as well, safe chews. Um, Please no raw hide. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it can cause problems. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't like raw hide. Right. There are some great alternatives uh, to that now. Tree bark and um, the ostrich twists that, mm -hmm. that you recommend. Dental flossing. You know, lots of good alternatives. Mm -hmm. uh, yakas. Um, but give the give the dog things that they can chew. Now, chew, chewing is a uh, behavior that a lot of dogs have to do. Mm -hmm. So we have to understand, you know, chewing is, is for a lot of dogs a real necessity. Um, it's calming for mm -hmm. them. It, it stimulates areas of the brain that are calming. So it's, in fact, something to be encouraged in dogs that they chew. Mm -hmm. um, so chewing, licking, sniffing, these are very calming activities for dogs. Uh, really great if you've got a hyper dog and you can get them into a habit of, of you know, have, sitting down calmly and, and chewing on something. Um, so if you can, again, set up your house so that you put things away that you don't want them to chew. You don't leave the dog to be just unemployed. Mm. You know, if you're going out, pop the dog in, 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 in their room, you know, if it's the kitchen or a utility, or if you're crate taming your dog, pop them in the crate mm. uh, and teach them to be comfortable to be there. But, you know, don't leave them to roam the house and find things to, mm. to destroy. Um, boredom mm. is a reason why dogs chew. Mm. Um, so human error is often the cause of chewing because we simply didn't manage the situation and stop the dog from making a mistake mm -hmm. and we didn't provide them with, with other outlets for mm -hmm. the chewing uh, that, that were acceptable to us. Um, as we mentioned, separation anxiety, if the dog is really destructive chewing, especially if it's chewing at, at, at you know, the boundaries of things, doors and things, could be a case of separation anxiety. I would recommend getting a, a, a behaviorist in to your home to do an assessment. Um, so really destructive chewing could be the sign of a, of an anxiety. Mm. Okay, I'm really glad to, to hear um, you, you kind of separate the two out there. You know, we've got, you know, they, they are, you know, chewing is a normal behavior. It's a little bit of the wild mm. that we have in our house. Uh, dogs aren't fashion accessories. Um, no, we, we uh, and digging, you know, digging, dig. Do dogs, some dogs have to dig, it is yeah. part of their make me a happy dog, um, yeah. especially if you've got a cockapoo, <laughs> you know, <laughs> they love to dig, yeah, yeah, um, that's true. if you don't want them digging holes in your garden, go and get a sand pit, fill it with, you know, sand and a bit of mud, Yeah. bury some exciting things in there and direct your dog to go and dig in that. I, I, and I, it makes me uncomfortable when I, I talk, sit here about people, you know, trying to prevent their dogs exhibiting these normal behaviours because it's almost like you're not accepting, you're, you're preventing them from doing something that they find pleasurable and that they Absolutely. want to do. Yeah, and for some dogs it's more important than others, you know, if, especially if in their breed type, you know, digging is, is in their DNA. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you've got Dachshunds, for example, uh, uh, Jack Russells. These, these are dogs that really love to dig. They love to burrow into things. Um, you know, even if, if you've got a dog that's a burrower, you know, give them plenty of blankets on their bed mm -hmm. so they can dig themselves into a nice little burrow. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you look at your dog and understand what your dog was designed to do, mm -hmm. intended to do. Um, and if they're displaying these kind of normal behaviors, you know, the digging and chewing things, give them an outlet for that because it is really important and you, you can kick off some um, you know emotional problems in a dog if you no. totally prevent you know yeah. get a ball pit 
I have a ball pit for my dog. He forages for food in the ball pit that oh, satisfies his little digging urge. It's not big in a chihuahua, but he loves to sort of dig around and, you yeah. know, and, and it's, it's no mess and, and it's a great Fabulous. way to just great help idea. him get it, get that in. Yeah. Marvellous. Well, let, let's go, let's try some of these one-liners. I don't think any of these are answerable in one line. But if we can. <laughs> so how do I persuade my dog to eat? Fussy dogs. Well, mm. fussy dogs. Um, some dogs are tricky on the mm. eating. Um, in like some kids. rare cases, there is doggy anorexia, but mm -hmm. again, that is rare. Mm -hmm. um, if you think that's your dog, please take them to the vet. Mm -hmm. um, there may be an underlying medical issue mm -hmm. for, for that. Uh, but there are other dogs that really just, they're, they're not that bothered about food. Mm -hmm. All Labrador owners right now are going, <laughs> really? <laughs> um, there are dogs like that what, out there. <laughs> uh, yeah, certainly there are dogs that don't eat. Uh, you can make um, food times more stimulating. Mm. Um, uh, I, I love, uh, my, my dog doesn't eat much. He's a chihuahua. He can be very fussy, um, Can used to go for days without mm. eating. And it, it's very distressing for the owner when your dog will not and does not mm. want to eat. Um, again, worth thinking about the dog's life because not eating and stress are linked. Mm. So if you have a dog that's stressed, can you remove the stresses from the life of the dog? And in that way, the dog may eat uh, better. Mm -hmm. um, and stresses might be noise, they might be children um, who are perhaps, you know, not giving the dog enough rest. Mm -hmm. um, so again, that safe space for the dog to go to where the kids are told, you know, if the dog's there, you don't play with the dog, you know, let mm -hmm. the dog rest. Um, dogs need a lot of sleep, 15, 16, 17 hours, you know, not unusual, a lot more than people realize. Mm -hmm. um, so an over aroused dog may may not eat mm. um, that well. Um, and then you can make the food more rewarding. Um, so I like to get, I like to keep a collection of um, old egg boxes and, and cartons, food cartons, um, Amazon paper wrapping, you know, the, when you get the boxes and they've got the big bit of paper in the Amazon wrapping, they're mm. great. Um, and, you know, put the dog's food in those. Mm. Um, and uh, so the dog has to kind of work for the food. Mm -hmm. uh, now, if you've got a dog that's very reticent, you might want to start with, you know, little tidbits, a bit more exciting, uh, don't make it too difficult, but you can build that up. Um, and often that can be a solution for dogs that don't want to eat much, that they like to, to work for it a bit and, and find it more rewarding and will eat more if, if they're working for it. Um, uh, and one final check, if they're, if they're not, e they're really not eating, check for allergies. Dog mm -hmm. might feel a bit unwell. Uh, may actually be allergic to something in the food that's just putting them off the food. Um, so worth having a little blood check for that as well. Cheers. That was the world's longest sentence, by the way. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, uh, let, let's wrap this up. Last one. My friend's dog aggression with people. Well, I'm 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 going to kind of say this is impossible to answer in, in one sentence. And There's, first, yeah. Firstly, one one website I'll send you to. That's what I was yeah. going to say. I was going to say, <laughs> have you got any resources that people can go to to look for these questions, uh, you know, answers to these questions or, or look for further for, further help? Yeah, there are some fantastic Facebook groups now uh, okay. that you can ask to join. Uh, for that scenario, uh, Reactive Dogs UK mm -hmm. on uh, Facebook. A uh, specialist group for dogs that react, i.e. they bark at other dogs, mm. they bark at people, uh, they, they bark at bicycles or cars or things that mm. will seem to, to react, um, bark at, at, the, at the door, etc. They, they are, um, uh, Reactive Dogs UK is great. Um, and then there is dog training and behavior. So I can, I can pop these on the um, site, John, to, to link people to. That'd be great if you could um, pop them in the comments in this video when, when it eventually arrives. On yeah, board, okay, great. I'll pop it in the comments. Yeah. So these, these are great sites. They are run by uh, trainers mm -hmm. um, and uh, admins who are, are really good and really hot on, or, uh, on issues. Um, and you'll get good general training advice on, on the uh, dog behavior one. Um, and another fantastic uh, Facebook is Canine Enrichment. Mm -hmm. So there's a group called Canine Enrichment, lots and lots of ideas for keeping your dog sort of mentally stimulated and therefore happy. And again, a lot of problem behaviors arise because the dog is bored mm -hmm. or not, it, you know, it doesn't have uh, the, the kind of things that they, they need in life, like, you know, ability to chew and tear things and chase things. 
Um, and so canine enrichment is a great Facebook as well with tons of ideas. So I'll pop those three into the uh, into the feed after this. Fabulous. Well, I, I think we've kind of run out of time now yeah. as well. Um, that that was amazing, Nat. Um, you know, I, I really, really appreciate you taking the time out tonight to talk to us all about this. I know you, you're not even particularly local, so, you know, this is all done out of the, the goodness of your heart and trying to spread the word, really, about how we can look after our, our pets a little bit better. So, you know, I'd like to say thank you for myself and everyone in the group. I know I've certainly learned an awful lot tonight. Um, that, that, that was absolutely fabulous. And um, I'll try and put this video onto the group there. Uh, so people can go back through it and look at these comments and, and all that sort of thing. So I can see people there saying thanks very much to you here. It's been great, Nats. Thank you. Pleasure, thank so you. Much thank you everyone that. for and listening we'll... and um, yeah, love your dogs. Enjoy and, uh, them. <laughs> I think you said yeah. earlier offline that you wouldn't mind me if if I tag you into various mm -hmm. conversations that that come up on the group and because you know I'm not a behaviorist. I've picked up things over the years, but you know, talking to very knowledgeable people like yourself. But you know, I think you know, I think. You know, this this is an incredible conversation, really, because we we skipped over so many things. I mean, we could have talked yeah. an hour and a half just on, you know, chewing. You know, it, it's, yeah. it's such an in-depth, interesting thing to do. And I think you did a, a fabulous job of giving us a really general, general picture. So thanks very much. And, uh, well, it looks Pleasure. forward to seeing you on the group. Yes. Thank okay. you. <laughs> Night all. Thank you Bye very much. Nice. Bye. 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 There we go. Uh, I think I th oh.